do you want to eat? Do you want to eat broadcast slot? There we go. So, whoop, I'll start. Let's go back up one slide for a minute. There we go. So, um, my name's Jen Mixes Olds. I am the chair of this committee on ocean acoustics education and expertise. And this is the fourth in a series of information gathering panels as part of our committee process um, on outreach that you've all been invited for. And I wanted to thank you right off the bat for spending this hour with us and, and sharing your thoughts and expertise and ideas related to ocean acoustics outreach. The other panels that we've had have been um, workforce development, early career um, discussion, we had ocean acoustics education, and now outreach. And so all of these will be very critical as we get into the statement of work on our committee and everybody will have a chance to introduce themselves in just a minute. So if we go on to the next slide, today's meeting is really, oops, where did, oh, there you go. Um, is really to collect information and perspectives from, from all of you to help inform the writing of the committee's report and specifically to outreach. Um, we want to hear from professionals in acoustics and ocean acoustics on really three different um, areas. General public visibility and awareness, which includes K through 12 students, their parents, which we're learning more and more um, is important, and overall DEI, how to reach out to a greater public and community. To receive an overview of ocean acoustics and ocean acoustics outreach, what's working, what's not working. This kind of goes right into the, to the example of successes and challenges and outreach. We um, are very, the committee understands this is a very interdisciplinary topic and it poses some very unique challenges for outreach when we um, have such um, wide needs and um, applications now that ocean acoustics is being used for. So specific to the statement of work for this committee, um, we have compiled, can go to the next slide. We have compiled a very diverse committee. Um, myself, I'm a chair at the University of New Hampshire where I'm the director of the Center for Acoustics and Education. We have Andrea Anguelas from um, Penn State University, Art Bagger from MIT, Liesl Hodling from Eidos Education, Wu Zhang Li from the University of Washington, Carolyn Rupel from um, US Geological Survey, Gail Skol Skolcroft from um, URI, and Preston Wilson from the University of Texas, Austin. So we will be listening keenly today and try and harvest as much as we can from, from the discussion. Um, next slide. This is our statement of work for the overall committee. I'm not gonna um, read the whole thing out, but really this outreach component um, comes in, in in two places. Um, assess the demand for acoustics expertise as anticipated over the, ne the next decade and exploration of strategies to raise the profile of careers in ocean acoustics. And that includes the education, training, workforce recruitment, and retention. So outreach plays more than a role of just visibility, but career opportunities too, not just the science, but the career opportunities that feed right into the workforce, um, it's, which is the lens that we are looking at this information through as a committee in responding to this statement of task. And a little bit more detail, if you can go to the next slide. The report will include information on. So outreach, we've, we've learned already, kind of spans many of these things, but it will have a specific chapter um, in our report, bringing that all together as we move into recommendations of the committee. So outreach, we understand, is, is key to education. It's key to workforce development. It's key to training programs. Um, and that's one of the challenges that our community as a whole is encountering right now. So um, we have one more slide. Nope, next slide is logistics, I think. And I'm gonna turn this over to Leanne to talk about logistics for the next uh, 55 minutes. Hi, I'm Leanne. I'm an associate program officer um, and the current study director for this project. And just 
general uh, Zoom meeting logistics, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, if when we have time for um, questions, feel free to raise your hand. I see we do have some guests. We'll prioritize the committee questions first, but then when we have time, we'll open it up to guests. Um, and feel free to send any comments or questions in the chat. Um, and when you're speaking, please turn on the camera. The session will be recorded for the community members that are not here um, so that they can watch it later on. Um, but that's it. And then next slide. I can take over from here. Yeah. So um, we're going to have a chance now to meet each of our panelists. And um, you, I think you guys get about a five minute introduction of who you are and um, what outreach that you've been involved with. So I'll start, I'll just go down my list here. Um, John Ryan, you can introduce yourself first, welcome. Sure, thank you, Jen. And uh, are we using our slides at this time or that's later? Do you, yes, we can use slides. Um, did you send them in or do you just wanna share your screen? Um, we did send them in, but I suppose we could also. You can do either yeah. one. I we have okay. a, yeah. There we go, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, Will's Will's going to start us off. We're we're one team. <laughs> okay, so uh, you'll be hearing from John Ryan and Will Ashton. Yeah, actually, if you don't mind, there are uh, quite a few animations in here, so maybe I could share the screen and drive a little bit, if that's easier. Um, yeah, of course. Cool. Thank you. Um, we're informal and friendly here, so we have the time to sort of bounce okay. back and forth to, to get the best presentation here. That's great. Thank you. Uh, great. Yeah. So uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. Yeah. I, as Jen mentioned, my, my name is Will A. Strike. I'm a postdoc at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. I work closely with John Ryan, who will be speaking uh, for part of these slides as well. Um, and just to give an overview of where in the world we are doing acoust ocean acoustics research and outreach and education. Uh, this is a map of the uh, central California coast. Uh, you can see uh, MARS is the Monterey Accelerated Research System. It's a um, cabled observatory on the seafloor outside of Monterey Bay. Uh, it's attached to our labs here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, or MBARI, uh, in Moss Landing, California, right in the middle of the bay and at the uh, origin of that deep submarine canyon that runs off of Monterey Bay. Uh, it's a really great place for uh, listening um, in that uh, it is very close to the shipping lanes, which bisect the um, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and also a great listening location for recording the sounds of uh, many of the amazing life forms that live in this uh, National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and so here's an image of the hydrophone that's attached to this cabled observatory uh, at Mars. Uh, and John Ryan has been leading this program uh, since the summer of 2015. There's been nearly continuous recording, uh, feeding near real-time data to shore for uh, both research and outreach purposes. Um, and John will speak a little bit more about that shortly. I'll just mention briefly that this hydrophone that we're showing here on the Mars Cable Observatory is really the centerpiece of this uh, passive acoustics program run out of Mbari, but there are a number of other different uh, more temporary nodes that we've had throughout the region uh, for listening and learning about um, the ecosystems off of this coast. Um, just to highlight some of the things that we've uh, been using these instruments to learn about, um, one species we focus on a lot uh, because they're a great candidate for learning about behavior using acoustics is the blue whale. Um, some of the things we've learned is that they have uh, daily patterns in their songs, which indicate their behavioral state, whether they're feeding or whether they're migrating south on their breeding migration. Uh, using this ability to discern the behavioral state of individuals, we found that these animals flexibly time their migrations to track interannual variation in productivity in Monterey Bay. Um, more within this feeding season, we're uh, starting to use sound, uh, in particular a directional hydrophone or an acoustic vector sensor, which can point to where these sounds are originating from to understand how these animals track dynamic and patchy prey in Monterey Bay. Um, and finally, starting to dig deeper now into how these animals are using long distance communication to facilitate social foraging and collective migrations. Um, we've also focused on um, the impacts of human noise 
in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, this is work that John led a couple of years ago, uh, showing that uh, reduction in shipping noise in the deep sea uh, during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and showing that this noise reduction was uh, highly correlated with uh, changes in offshore shipping traffic in this region. Um, finally, most recently, we've been going to some more uh, cryptic animals that are, are hard to study in any other way, really, other than acoustics, uh, using uh, this long-term uh, passive acoustic monitoring program to study the behavior of sperm whales uh, off of Central California, um, showing that they're present year-round, except uh, despite the extreme rarity of sightings of these animals, um, and also using a um, uh, some combination of simulation techniques and uh, actual empirical observation of these animals acoustically to understand their seasonal migration patterns in the Northeast Pacific. Um, this is all just to set the stage uh, for. Uh, some of the research and discovery we've been focused on, but then how we're uh, sharing that through uh, outreach and education, which John is going to speak a little bit more to here. Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, and the, the discoveries are really fascinating and exciting. Um, and many people in our audience, including primary and secondary school students, are fascinated by the discoveries. And yet just letting them experience the sounds of life in the ocean, we found to be just really both wonderful, engaging um, and inspiring to children of all ages. <laughs> so one of the places we've done this is through developing um, public exhibits that are uh, anchored in tourist destinations actually with the, the two NOAA um, National Marine Sanctuary Monterey Bay Natural Marine Sanctuary Visitor Centers. These are free and open to the public and school gr groups come through, dropped off on a bus and as well as many tourists. And basically we were fortunate to work with uh, Lisa Utah and others at this center for the first exhibit where they helped us understand how do you engage the public? How do you deliver that both experience and in this case that is hearing, seeing and feeling sound um, and how do you leave them with a message, a take home message, all in 15 to 20 seconds per species? <laughs> so we did that for this center and then another one, the Coastal Discovery Center in San Simeon, um, and added some new sounds for that exhibit. So next uh, bit there, Will. Yeah, um, we have a live stream and a recording library, including an Alexa skill that you can put on your smart speaker. And I don't know if you shared sound, Will, did you, when you shared screen? We will find out shortly. <laughs> Are you all hearing this? No. No problem. A little reboot. <laughs> um, I think if you... Here we go. I think if you stop, ask oh, good. Ocean soundscape to play humpback whale. Here is a six minute, 43 seconds recording of a single humpback whale song. They can repeat their songs for many hours. Okay. There it is. Oh, huh. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> oh, are you scared? <laughs> listen, listen, listen. How did you make that sound? Oh my gosh. Yeah, and that's just my, when we were first trying out the Alexa skill, these are my coworkers' daughters who, who you know, naturally questions spout out like a fountain. So last little bit there, Will, is... is Alexa. Um... Oh, um, the mobile exhibit. We take a mobile exhibit um, all over the place. Sanctuary, well, the Exploration Center in San Francisco, which has a huge attendance, K-12 classroom visits all the time. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite audiences actually are the very young children. So so last note here is when, when I first went to a preschool, there was a, a, a young girl sitting in a beanbag, a four-year-old, rolling around in the front. And then I asked the question, what is sound? And she stops rolling around in that beanbag. She starts gesturing in front of her mouth and she says, you can't see it, but it moves. <laughs> I just thought, yes, you are 
on to it. So anyway, thanks for listening. I Sorry if we went a little over there, but um, education outreach is really central to what we want to do with our Soundscape project. Thank you. Thank you so much, both uh, John and Will. We're going to tease apart that more. That was pretty cool with the Alexa. I had a question. I'll ask my question later. Um, let's give a, a welcome to Kathy Vignes Raposa. Hi, um, I sent in some slides. Okay, so, uh, who's bringing those up? Zoe or Safa? Yeah, or give me one second. Okay. There we go. All right. Yeah, so I'm uh, Kathy Vignes Raposa. I am the co PI of the Dotsits Discovery of Sound of the Sea project um, with Gail Scowcroft, who I think you guys know. <laughs> and we've been doing this for over 20 years now, you know, communicating underwater acoustics research. Um, and I want to just provide a little bit of my background. Um, so, my deep dive into underwater sound um, came through my master's degree at the University of Rhode Island. And I was in biological oceanography and starting to know of the importance of acoustics in understanding our ocean world and the use of acoustics by so many animals. And so what we were trying to do was actually start to use acoustics to do um, passive acoustics modeling of survey efforts. And so in addition to having visual sightings, um, can we do passive acoustics? And so a simulation model to investigate, you know, how well do we need to know our marine mammals and their vocalization behaviors to do statistically valid surveys. And so um, I think my deep dive into acoustics is really kind of similar to a lot of other grad students where, you know, there's an interest in underwater acoustics, but it's really not my primary focus. And I wasn't getting a PhD in acoustics. Um, so I was able to take sort of signal processing and underwater acoustics courses at URI that complemented the other sort of marine mammalogy and geostatistics classes. Um, since then, I've got my PhD and I still continue to work in underwater sound, looking at the effects of sound on anthropogenic activities. Um, I'm a principal scientist within Inspire Environmental, which is a small consulting firm in, in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, and I'm also part-time faculty with the Department of Ocean Engineering um, and adjunct with the Natural Resources Sciences at URI. Um, and I've been part of several thesis committees, um, some of which are for marine affairs students who, again, are sort of tangentially interested in underwater acoustics, but, it, you know, it's not their main focus. And so it's great when there's opportunities for students who don't necessarily have the, the deep dive that an ocean engineering student would have um, for them to have those uh, outreach opportunities. Um, one of the other projects I've been involved in is a capstone project for ocean engineering undergrads. And so as seniors, they're required to take the capstone project. Um, and they've all been exposed to acoustics um, with one course as part of their bachelor's of science, but then they get to choose a focus. And so it's great that they've had that exposure and that it's even more interesting when they, you know, a handful of them select acoustics as their capstone project. And so um, they start to understand that multidisciplinary nature of ocean sciences and are working with a lot of panelists. Um, so my focus today really is gonna sort of talk about what we've wor work we've done with DOSITS um, as we've conducted um, several needs assessments of the underwater acoustics community. And I think, um, as you guys mentioned in the beginning, you know, that's really a broad audience of K through 12 educators, um, informal educators, undergraduate and graduate faculty, um, you know, and then more recently, we've been working a lot with decision makers and regulatory agencies um, and the media and how they report on science. And so um, for many of these community members, you know, they're interested in underwater acoustics and they can be ambassadors um, to much wider audiences. And so having resources available for them um, is great. So my thoughts today are gonna to focus on um, creating hooks that kind of capture the attention of potential community members and then draw them in and want them to be part of ocean acoustics and then providing resources at a variety of levels so that this diverse group of community members can continue to spread accurate knowledge. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, as part of our needs assessments, we've done this profile. So looking at um, who the community is and, and what their backgrounds are. And so um, again, in the last few years, focusing on decision makers, you know, less than half had had formal education related to acoustics. 49% um, have a master's degree, 32% have PhDs, 
And then 53% of those are in biological sciences. And so, you know, we have decision makers and regulators who are making decisions um, about ocean acoustics who may or may not have had um, any formal training. And the majority of them have had on the job training. And so it's, um, you know, professional meetings that they've attended, um, conferences that they've attended, um, and that, that really on the job, you know, quick and accurate information is, is critical for them. And again, and then often they need to make decisions in, you know, days um, to months. And so they really need something that's easy to digest. They do use peer reviewed literature, technical reports and other government resources and databases. Um, and similarly for K through 12 and informal educators, um, there are state science standards um, that have acoustics as part of or, or sound units. And so there is that opportunity to weave in underwater sound um, if we have appropriate resources. But again, you know, their profile is that they don't have that acoustics background and that they really probably need to find a resource that they can quickly implement in their classroom. So next slide, please. So thinking about kind of those hooks of how we can bring um, and increase interest, as I mentioned, you know, sound is a topic within um, state science curriculum standards. And, uh, and as John and Will mentioned, the informal educational opportunities are fantastic. And so providing kind of easy to implement resources that, that tie into specific topics um, is a great way to you know, hook in that community. Um, as we mentioned too, exposures to careers related to ocean acoustics. Um, a lot of times when you talk to students, um, you know, they don't see those connections and they don't see any opportunities besides you know, going and teaching at a university. And so providing exposure and a, that diversity of how you can be part of the ocean acoustics community um, is, a great, is a great mechanism to, again, hook them in. Obviously, there's always a lot of media attention to underwater impacts um, at both individual animals and at the population level. And then how can we monitor or reduce those potential effects? And again, that's something that's um, very high in the media quite often. So next slide. So finally, so we've, what we found is that the educational resources that are of most interest are internet-based, um, self-driven tutorials where people can um, look, learn that science background and provide those resources for them to develop their own learning, um, providing workshops, either multiple day or short courses, um, where again, tagging on to uh, an existing conference or um, some kind of other events. Uh, the DOSITS team has put together a webinar series since 2015, and it just blows my mind how many people <laughs> come to these webinars. You know, we have six to 700 people on each of our webinars, and um, it's just been an amazing resource. And then we also archive those webinars so people can read, um, watch them offline if they can't join during the, the active time. And then again, short educational videos, that kind of YouTube generation that we've come to, to know and love. So. So those are my thoughts. Thanks for the time today. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. And um, Odd Pacini, you're next. I hope I said that right. Uh, it's Ode, almost. Ode. Oh, good, no worries. Um, and if it's okay, I'll share my screen. Absolutely. Um, it's amazing that we're in the field of ocean acoustics and so many times it's the, the acoustics part of presentations that give us challenge. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Ode Pacini. I'm a researcher at the um, University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, today, I'll talk a little bit about um, our teaching at the lab as well as our outreach. Let me see. Can you guys see that okay? Um, so uh, the Marine Mammal Research Program is part of the University of Manoa. It's the largest campus of the UH system, and it's committed to being the leading indigenous serving university in the country. Uh, currently, we have several departments formally teaching acoustics, they include oceanography, electrical engineering, and physics. Um, our lab is um, at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, um, or HIMBN. I'm sorry, my toddler just woke up. Um, Mama? I'm so sorry. I thought 7 a.m. was going to be a perfect time. Um, 
Anyway, Lizzie, yeah, but you just talk to us. Sorry about that. Um, and HIMB's mission is to advance our understanding of marine life through innovative science and education that honor people and place to benefit Hawaii and the world. Um, formerly, our, our lab um, focused heavily on acoustics. So our PIs were Whitlow Au and Paul Nactable, that many of you probably know. Um, and at the time, we did have um, formal acoustic courses. Um, since then, we've shifted more towards a ecology holistic approach uh, to study marine mammal health and conservation. So we do not offer an actual graduate course in acoustic. Um, we still have very strong collaborative effort with our partners uh, locally. Um, and uh, they include uh, NOAA, the Humback Whale Sanctuary, uh, as well as the University of Hawaii Applied Research Laboratory. Uh, currently, our effort at the Marine Mammal Research Program um, in terms of teaching through graduate students um, consists of hands-on experience and project-based, uh, our project-based. Um, just a few of the projects that are happening, uh, one of our student, student Kirby Purnell, is uh, studying the acoustics of Hawaiian monk seals, and I have a little clip for you that Kirby let me use. Um, can you guys hear that? And that's a big hit for all of our outreach. Um, when we have students try to guess the sound, they love to listen to the whoop that monk seals do. Um, this is the first time, believe it or not, that um, those uh, sounds are recording in situ. Another student, uh, another student is studying um, how marine protected areas provide some sort of uh, shelter acoustically for pilot whale and false killer whales here in Hawaii. Uh, and finally, we are looking at humback whale communication from archival tags. Um, we have a lot of undergraduate student opportunities, um, either through directed research where they'll gain uh, credits um, and they can assist with data collection and acoustic analysis. Um, currently, the formal acoustic classes we suggest students take are through uh, electrical engineering and they are offered every other year, unfortunately, so we highly suggest to students take summer classes such as Friday Harbor. Um, when needed, uh, we have identified that students will need to take calculus um, or formal acoustic courses that has come up a few times. Um, and as everyone can attest here, we always emphasize taking computer programming classes. Oh. Um, one thing I really wanted to uh, cover today is our SMILE program or um, Summer Intensive Marine Mammal Experience. Sorry. Um, and this is um, Kirby Purnell and Brigitte Madrigal's project. They've created this uh, course and uh, apply for the funding. We're just really here to support them. Uh, they are in their sophomore year of this program. It's a summer course where students will spend between a week to 10 days at Coconut Island at HIMB with us to learn about marine mammal science. Um, the course includes uh, formal training, field trips where they'll uh, you know, dip a hydrophone and listen to spinner dolphins or pilot whales, depending on what they see out there. Um, they have workshops, peer bonding uh, exercises, and this is for um, uh, senior and uh, junior students um, in high school. Um, so far, they've had 21 students, 61% um, are Native Hawaiians, and 83% are from historically marginalized uh, community communities. Um, some of the metrics, seven of the eight seniors that uh, graduated this year are going to college. Some of them have shifted their uh, emphasis to marine biology. Uh, they had a, a big pool of applicants last year for the first year. They had 42 applicants for um, 10 spots. And this year they got 84 applicants uh, from all islands here in Hawaii. Um, in total, they had over 30 speakers from 10 organizations. They created a website, reports. There's a Voice of the Sea. This is a Sea Grant uh, documentary that's being recorded this week. Um, many testimonials from uh, the Department of Education, instructors, parents, and, and obviously the students, um, and a great media uh, reach. Uh, it made the news four times, and uh, UH also covered it. And that was funded. Uh, 
through a variety of, of funding agencies. And uh, we recently got awarded a two-year BWET, which is the uh, Bay Watershed Education and Training um, that um, support locally relevant and authentic experiential learning K-12. Let's see. Oops. My presentation. Okay. Okay. Uh, and my last slide uh, is about our, our outreach effort. Um, as everyone here, we, we do a lot of guest lecturing. Uh, I was recently part of the Marine, Mole uh, Marine Molecular Mentorship Program at HIMB. That's led by the Coral Resilience Lab. That was actually features in uh, Netflix Chasing Coral. Um, we, we try to have our activities really focus on connecting the local community to their backyard. We found that a lot of um, students and even adults have never seen a monk seal, um, have never been out on the water and see um, spinner dolphins. So we, we really try to, to bring that closer to home. Uh, we have a strong social media presence. Um, three uh, of our media stories combined have reached over half a billion viewers. Um, and finally, one, uh, one of the effort we're really proud about is, is bridging that, that, that gap between science and art. Uh, we will be part of the Symphony of the um, Hawaiian Sea in 2025, working with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. And uh, last December, we were very fortunate to be uh, part of a collaborative effort with Yo-Yo Ma and the Hopulea, which is part of the Polynesian Voyage Society, um, where we all met uh, aboard Hopulea, which is a canoe that uh, uses uh, the traditional Polynesian way of navigating um, to listen to Yo-Yo Ma perform on the road to the whale. So I'll, I'll just play this little clip right there. And um, the funny story is there's actually a, a humpback whale breaching right here that everyone on the boat completely missed because we were so um, captivated by Yo-Yo Ma. up here because I think I'm running out of time. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. And we have about 30 minutes and I think um, you all sort of got a, an update or you got the outreach panel task here. And I think we're really going to focus on, on two topics. One, um, how do we as a community um, raise awareness and visibility of the value and importance of ocean acoustics to society as a whole. Um, and then number two, how is it that outreach events or efforts can recruit people from different fields, such as music, marine mammals, other places? Because I have a feeling, and if, if anybody is like myself and many other on this panel, we didn't go to school in elementary, middle school, high school saying, you know, we're gonna be in ocean acoustics. Most of us fall into it by happenstance. And so how do we create a better environment with higher profiles for careers in um, ocean acoustics? And so let's, let's go with the first one first. Your thoughts on how to better raise awareness of the value of ocean acoustics to society. And that's all ocean acoustics, active acoustics, passive acoustics, um, all different areas of acoustics. So, so I'll let who wants to go first on that one. It's a big question and you're all doing it in different ways, but what are the, what are the key things that, that you focus on in your outreach? Yeah, I think, um, you know, as we experienced on this in this meeting, hearing the sounds produced by ocean life allows people to immediately feel a connection to it. And um, that's just, I feel like that's, at least in the outreach we've done, uh, that's the most powerful way to, to get people engaged. And then 
that's a great opening for explaining how the ocean is a world of sound, the relative importance of light and sound flips when you cross the air-sea interface. And why do we why do we study sound in the ocean? How, how does it reveal the lives of animals we otherwise really can't see? And why is our noise a big, big issue for, for their lives? So that's sort of for me the um, the entry point for raising awareness. Who wants to build on John? I'll, I'll contribute. So I would agree. You know, we have the audio gallery as part of the, the Dosets website. And it's one of those areas where, you know, you can lure in people from two to three years old to, you know, 300 years old, you know, and, and it's like, and they don't even think about it. You know, it's like, what does lightning sound like underwater? And they're like, oh, wow, it make, you know, it makes a sound like, what does rainfall sound like underwater? And then you get into, so why do we care about rainfall? Well, there's climate change, there's changing, you know, weather patterns, you know, and by measuring in places where we don't have vessels and we don't have, you know, we see, you know, we can put out these long-term recorders that can make these environmental measurements and you, and you can, again, lure them into deeper content. And I think it, I think it's a great mechanism for making them think about it and then bringing it around to, so why do we use sound or how is sound used by so many animals? You know, that, that light doesn't work and we need something else. And it's not just, you know, everything out there isn't just noise that it really is sounds that are being used for a very important purpose. Thank you. Another way to think of it too for is all of all of our panel speakers today are from coastal states. You have ocean, uh, you know, bordering your states. One of the challenges that the, the community has had in a whole is how do you reach the sectors not on the coast? You know, there's there are aquariums that are not on the coast, but we tend to we tend to sort of concentrate our efforts coastally. Has anybody had um, experience? I think John said they they have a traveling exhibit and so forth. But how do you notice a difference between people who live on the coast and experience the sound and that connection versus those that don't? I think Will had his hand up, then he disappeared. There he is. I'm going to yield to Will here because his hand was up first. <laughs> I, I think the comment I had is not as relevant to this particular question. So I'll circle back um, if you had thoughts, John. Well, I, yeah, just one thought that your, your question raises to me is, you know, in terms of the theme of education, what we found is when we open up our data and free open source analysis tools to access it and use it. Um, we've been surprised, for example, a high school student actually has now got a web app um, that he's brought to international meetings that he's gotten uh, approved by UNESCO as a resource. And it's, it's a, this is a high school student living in nowhere near the ocean who um, has taken up ocean noise as a particular interest and now developed a tool that takes in data from many places and gives you a global picture of ocean noise. So in this case, I don't, this student was just very interested in how we understand the ocean because it probably, because it is a strange environment relative to his everyday experience. Uh, David? I wanted to follow up with what Kathy was talking about, the environment and awareness of the environment. There was an old experiment that uh, Walter Monk, I believe it was, uh, proposed to look at um, the ocean tomography, sending sound from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Basin. And you could measure the temperature of the oceans and changes in the temperature of the oceans. And so in terms of climate change, the ocean, the big buffer of the Earth, is something we could monitor with that type of experiment. But of course, with this group, we all know that those type of frequencies would be damaging to marine mammals. And so it's kind of a trade-off between trying to uh, monitor our planet in a way that is also safe to the uh, animals that are in the ocean. And so that's a whole other different avenue of research. But, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is active and hopefully passive 
acoustics that we can use existing sounds in the ocean might be a way to move forward to monitor changes in the ocean temperature. Thank you, Ode. Um, to um, going back real quick to the question about coastal environment, I think um, I think it's it's really dependent on the community you're reaching, and and generally speaking, you're going to have coastal communities that never go in the water, never you know, um, and 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 we saw that with our smart program. So those kids had never been snorkeling before, and we live in Hawaii. We're surrounded by water. Um, so I think there is, you know, a component that is um, is community based um, and not necessarily geographically based. Will had his hand up. Yeah, one thought. This is um, maybe a little bit more forward looking, or maybe others on the call uh, are already doing this. But I, I've wondered about the potential for more. Uh, you know, speaking, uh, building off of Ode's comment about like community science, um, about uh, making this work more participatory to help people understand what is occurring and, and just uh, have a deeper sense of connection to this ocean acoustics work. Um, I've been involved with a project that uh, uses open acoustic devices, uh, audio moths um, in a terrestrial bioacoustic setting to, um, be a, a part of a research project, but really mostly a community outreach program where they're sending a large number of these audio moths to folks around the country uh, to engage with soundscapes in their, you know, everyday life. Um, and, you know, as these sorts of tools become more and more available in the ocean as well, um, things like uh, the hydromoth version of this open acoustic device, um, I think there is a lot more potential for not only sharing the sounds with folks, but also sharing the process of capturing those sounds with folks to uh, have a deeper sense of connection there. Yeah, I think Kathy had her hand up next. Yeah, thanks. And um, I, actually, I was going to, building on what Will just said, I was going to actually talk about um, some work that we're doing as part of the, the UN Ocean Decade for Sustainability, where there's, again, and so that DEI interest of increasing communities that are involved in work and that you can do sort of citizen science measurements, whether it's in a river or even in an aquarium, you know, even a little fish tank that you, you know, 20 gallon tank you might have in a classroom. And that if there's, you know, something that's less expensive and really easy to use, that we can start to have people going out and measuring all kinds of different things and then providing that access to them um, with some backup um, technology and then signal processing and, you know, that slowly gets them in you know, deeper and deeper as they go. And I, th I think there's a lot of opportunity, as and, as Ola mentioned, it's context-based of bringing communities in with what they have within their, their, their reaches. I think John had his hand yeah. up next. Yeah, Hello. Hello. This conversation is um, just reminding me of a, another pathway to reaching students and, you know, as importantly, their teachers. So there's this is a program called Earth Education and Research Testing Hypotheses. It's run by George Matsumoto here at Ambari, and it brings in teachers on their summer breaks, funds their participation because otherwise teachers um, have to fund the, these things themselves, and it teachers work directly with scientists to, to develop curriculum for their classrooms. And in, and in that sense, you know, the, they're more likely to be used than just like handing off a kit because the teacher actually co-developed the content. And that I've, is a very effective way for uh, reaching primary and secondary education. Good point, teaching the teachers to teach. Ode? Had her hand up, yeah. I think. Yeah, so um, I had two points. I, I was talking to the coral lab and some of their outreach effort is to have the community plant a coral. And I was like, well, we can't do that with marine mammals. We just can't bring you know a bunch of the community to look at dolphins. That becomes a little challenging. Uh, but but I think there is some really promising avenues with um, acoustic data and, and 
uh, researchers sharing their data, making it um, open access and having, you know, format like FLAC where it's easily downloadable and, and not like those massive files that we've all had to deal with in the past. I think what's missing perhaps is we don't have an easy, affordable plug and play system that teachers can take with them. Um, or there's no app like there are for songbirds where you can download it for free, you know, put your, your phone next to it and you can tell within seconds which bird is singing it. I think that's that's kind of maybe the disconnect we're still struggling with is a hydroform is is never 10 bucks, it's never 30 bucks. It's 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 always kind of a of an investment for teachers or for educators. So maybe for me it's it's kind of one of those gaps that's difficult to bridge. Yeah, and I think that um awareness and visibility are everything that you guys have talked about really have, have spoken to awareness and visibility. One of the challenges that, that we're tasked with as a committee is how do we take the next step and go beyond the awareness and visibility to say, you can make a living this way. You can have a career. What are the different career options? And I know that like UNH, for example, we have a second day to our annual acoustic symposium where it's careers in ocean acoustics. It's a career development day where we invite um, businesses and federal organizations and so forth to come and say, this is what I do in my job and this is how we use ocean acoustics. How do we better as a whole, as a nation and a community, recruit people from different fields into acoustics? Because we're learning as a committee that there's a, there's a big gap in um, where where people are getting their education and what type of education is needed. So those that are going to see and operating calibrating systems at a marine tech level, for example, have a very different education and job than um, those that are teaching in a university or developing sonars for military use. So any thoughts on how to better ad not advertise but recruit into the community that, that this isn't a valid, career path. That's more than just the visibility and interest, um, you know, a day at an aquarium or, or in a class. How do we as a community better highly profile career paths in ocean acoustics? Because there's also, there's so many. People don't even know. Oh, oh sorry, I thought I saw a hand up. I do. Yes, there's a hand up. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I thought I saw a hand. <laughs> Two, three hands up. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, you know, for what it's worth, I'm, I'm perhaps stating the obvious, but these engaging documentaries that that we find, whether it's Fathom on Apple TV or mm -hmm. or or even brief video and audio that you find on dosits, as long as the students can be steered to these inspiring stories. I think that's just a great way to open up their consideration of possible career paths that involve ocean acoustics. Um, Liz had her hand up next. Thanks, hi everyone. Oh, there we go. Hi everyone, um, I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, it is challenging obviously because there's such a wide you know, range of possibilities. Um, one thing that was developed recently by Marine Mammal Special Interest Group at IMRS. I'll put a link to it in the chat. Is a it's a marine mammal career matrix. So not you know obviously a static document, but and I'm not a proponent for static documents ever <laughs> because you lose people really quickly. But um, but I mean something along those lines. Of, you know having something people can dig into in order to work out what potential pathways and what skill sets are needed for those pathways might be a some form of digital tool might be useful. Um, I, I, it's a challenge, it's a challenge for us. We, we kind of realize that there needs to be uh, more investment, time investment and in getting people really familiar with things. So we've gone with the apprenticeship kind of model. It's low stake for us because you limit it in terms of time, but make it long enough they can gain something. So I don't, I don't know how hooking people is easier when you have a shorter, shorter thing they can bite off and chew if they want to get a feel for things. In fact, half of the people that we've had in our apprenticeships basically were not appropriate. They've figured out they didn't like it. So, I mean, that's 
a good way of, of working things out. So more, more kind of opportunities or involvement like that, where folks are, you know, getting a, a real sense for things. But I mean, that's, that's for people that you want to potentially train and have work for you. So anyway, just a couple thoughts. No, that, that's a good thought because sometimes learning what you don't want to do um, is, is, is as valuable as learning what you do want to do. So those are the people that we, we want to target because then they're retained in the field, not just recruited. So that's a good point. Retention versus recruitment. Thank you. Um, other hands. What, I saw another hand. Well, who was it? Uh, David. Yeah, I think data is very useful. Having a web page that just lists all the various uh, employers that are trying to hire acoustic, people who do acoustics, what the salary ranges are, how often, how many people are they hiring per year, so that you know parents who are advising their kids to go into a certain discipline can say, oh, look at this. There's all kinds of great careers in ocean acoustics. And so we actually had that information all assembled on one web page site that would be easily accessible. That might be helpful. I mean, we talk about the new blue economy and all these new uh, potential jobs that will be available, but there's no one place you can go and kind of see them all together. And so maybe something like that might be helpful in encouraging students to see there's a, a pathway to careers with a certain salary range and so forth that might intrigue the, uh, the students and the parents. Thank you. Yeah, make it validate it, right? Yeah, this is a credible, this is a credible, credible. Um, Ode? Um, I completely agree with David. I, I, I get a lot of students asking what the salary range is. It's, it's surprising, but it, it comes up a lot. Um, uh, another thing I think um, on, on a web page like that is the path, because we, you know, we take physics and acoustics is a module with light and electromagnetic field, and it's just a little section of physics. And then some of us took, you know, oceanography or biological oceanography, and we use acoustics, but linking the two is, I think, where the disconnect is. is or we take calculus and we learn about derivative and integer, uh, you know, integers, and, and it's just, we never connect all of this until we get to grad school and unless we have a project where we have to apply all of that. Um, to me, that's, that's, that's one of the big disconnects. And that's where we see students, you know, that, that have to take more calculus because they don't understand some of, some of the, the, the processing that goes behind analysis. And, and projecting that need earlier rather than later mm -hmm. is, is very key. Then you get into the timing of, of, of what competencies are required for different careers. So yes, I think that you're right. And the list was a good idea. And I, I even took notes here saying, we don't need just a list. We need it some cool jazzy graphic that groups the different career paths by competency. So people are know upfront what they need to do to succeed in each kind of career path, whether that be military, or R&D engineering for sonars or policy and management, you know, they require different, different skills and competencies. And you're right. I think as a, no, there is no one place to really get that right now. Again, it's Arthur Bagger calling. I'm having trouble getting into this conversation, but can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Art. All right. I'm, I've been frustrated by doing this on an iPhone, uh, which was my last resort. Uh, I have two comments, on, uh, actually three in recruiting. Um, we find in the MIT Woods Hole program, and this is for the program globally, so it, it's not unique to ocean acoustics. The biggest attractor is the program we run for high school students between their junior and senior years. We select 40 of them, and it's very competitive. Uh, and we host them at the Oceanographic and assign them a mentor. And that is the biggest yield for us in terms of students that wish to matriculate into the program. Uh, and so I cast that out as a, a very effective and selective uh, way of recruiting things. Uh, the, the other, which in part recruited myself and I know a lot of my colleagues, is we were engaged either at a university or, or at a, a laboratory where 
out of the blue, we were assigned to be part of a program that used, which involved acoustics, but in, used a lot of our physics and engineering. Uh, and, and this is the ideal one for myself because uh, I came out of uh, college where, with an engineering science background, and this is something that acoustics demands. My, my final thought, which goes to an earlier comment, maybe several comments back, uh, I was intimately involved with Walter Mark's Heard Island experiment. Uh, I was one of the PIs with Walter, uh, and it was an experience. And we certainly did attract a lot of people to acoustics, but some of it was good, and a lot of it was bad because of the dispersions we cast on how we were going to kill every whale in the ocean, and which has turned out not to be true. It did hire our sensibilities about uh, how much sound we could make and led to the Navy's N45 program, but um, it, it has had a lasting effect. And I can tell you right now, it's an important one. This planet faces a problem of ocean warming. It's very big in the in the universe in the uh, newspapers now, because of the uh, intense uh, storms that we're getting. We just had a tor torrential rainfall here in Boston. Uh, the problem is that it has so hampered our ability to put these sound sources in the ocean to do basin-wide acoustic tomography. We call it acoustic thermometry. Uh, and, and we argue that it is a very viable tool for monitoring the health of ocean, the ocean temperature. It, it is a way that can go on morning, noon, and night uh, for as long as we want it to work. But unfortunately, it's been hampered by a lot of bad press. Uh, and, and so we need people that can become involved, but also uh, know their physics and engineering well, so some of these things can be uh, set aside. Because we do need this, and, and it's one of the two methods of sampling the ocean. The other one are the uh, RAFOS floats, so the SOFAR floats that uh, uh, Russ Davis at Scripps uh, uh, initiated two decades ago. We could have had two decades worth of, yeah. Uh, we have people popping up with hands to respond to some. All right. I, I can't see the hands, Jen. So well, I'm just okay. going on a soapbox that I haven't been able to be part of this conversation until just now. All right. So I would just conclude that, that somehow we have to change this situation and we need educated people to do it. Absolutely. And what, uh, the hand that popped up, Gail, uh, committee member, question or response? I actually wanted to address the comments that were made about having a one-stop shop for careers online related to um, what the career is like, what the preparation may, uh, what preparation may be required, and what the salary information um, might be. And I just wanted to let folks know that we have that on the DOSITS website. There is a career gallery. It is strictly ocean acoustics related. Um, it's not extensive. I think we have eight, 16 or 18-ish careers highlighted there with links to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics so they can get up to the minute salary information. Um, but I want to let you know that it is literally the least hit area on our website and we get millions of hits a year on the DOSITS website. So we're maybe doing something wrong if this is something that could be really useful um, because we'd like that to be visited, that resource to be visited more. Um, it just may be that we're not getting it in the, the hands of the right people, but I did want to let you know there is a one-stop shop that can be expanded and, um, uh, uh, and improved with the community's assistance. And that's cool, too, that you have stats on it, that it is, unfortunately, the least visited. So that's something that we can capture also on how to, how to do that. I, I, I recognize that we are very close to our time, if not just going over time. There's one hand up. So, um, Kathy, if you wanted to do a last uh, yeah. comment. And I'll be short. I think 
I think careers are, are critically important, but I think it's also the journey. And, and people have mentioned the path and having you know, paid internships so that students who can't afford to pay for a summer, you know, pay to go to summer school or pay to take a summer off to be part of something, you know, that they can be, they can start to understand what the path is to get to a career and start to develop those skills. And I think that that's, and as we mentioned, you know, capturing them early enough that they get the physics and the math so that when they get to grad school and they can maybe dive deeper, that um, they have, they've had that path and they understand that, that transition and the, the journey that needs to get to that end goal. Good point. And that's something that I've heard recently in other places that I've been is not just the the career, the end career, but the path, the career path, and even promotional paths to advance in a career is important. And so um, that's something that we're hearing now, I'm hearing at least over and over from different sectors that I interact with. Um, before I say goodbye, are there any other comments from the committee members before we end our time together? I just I just want to say thank you to our panelists. Um, this has been really helpful to us that will be charged with writing this section, especially. Um, and it was really interesting to learn about what's happening at your various institutions. Obviously, I'm very familiar with docets, but I wasn't as familiar with the rest of the program. So it was great to hear about it. And I, I will also echo all of our panelists. Thank you for your time and sharing your thoughts. I learned a bunch of new things, which is excellent. Um, and it also reinforced some of the other messages that we were receiving from other information um, gathering panels. So having those same messages reinforced in different um, in different places, in different conversations is really a good take home message for, for this committee. So I thank you so much for sharing this time with us. And um, I hope everybody has a, a good day or evening, depending on what time zone you're in. Oh, I should also say to any of the panelists, if there's something that um, you're laying awake tonight thinking, oh, I should have said this or shared this, please send an email to either me or anyone on the panel if there's something that you think of afterwards that we should consider and think about as we go into our report writing phase. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Have a Thanks, great day, everybody. everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.